um, for today's talk, which is part of our Identity, Democracy and Self-Transformation uh, seminar series here at the Centre. I'd like to pay our respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, the Ngunnawal people. These are sovereign lands that were never ceded, uh, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us uh, today. So we're delighted to be joined uh, online by Afsun Afsahi, uh, Assistant Professor of Political Theory at the University of British Columbia, uh, for their talk, Intersectionality and Democracy. We'll have roughly 30 minutes or so for the presentation, uh, which will then be followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to you. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks uh, for the invitation to come and give a talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Hans. Um, so I would also like to begin by acknowledging that I gratefully live and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. In particular, I'm joining you today from UBC's Point Grey campus, which is on the traditional lands of the Musqueam people. This acknowledgement is particularly important to keep in mind considering the topic of my presentation, Intersectional Oppression in Democratic Systems. This paper only makes references to the effects of settler colonialism as an ongoing structure of oppression. Its full effects, if taken seriously, would lead us to question some of the core principles of democracy. Now I'm hoping to take less than 30 minutes because I'm much more interested in your thoughts and suggestions than my own. Um, and as this is a work of pro progress, I really would appreciate that. So my paper responds to the systemic turn in democratic theory. This systemic turn, which came at the heels of another systemic turn, one in deliberative democracy, recognizes that no single practice or institution in a democracy can deliver on all the functions of democracy. I focus on Mark Warren's problem-based approach to democratic systems for a number of reasons. First, his account of the democratic system centers around the problems that democracy is meant to address empowered inclusion, collective agenda and will formation, and collective, collective decision making. This means that Warren does not assume that any of the practices he mentions, and I will go into details about that later, are inherently democratic on their own. They can serve or inhibit democratic functions depending on how they are utilized. This already opens the room to examine how intersectional oppression can challenge the way that these practices are used. Second, his account of the democratic system approach is conducive to thinking about power relationships and agency formations of individuals and collectivities within systems. Therefore, while his account is systemic, he leaves room for agents to act and modify systems. And in doing so, his approach departs from the model-based approaches, i.e. aggregative, deliberative, participatory, and instead sees different models as simply containing one system focused on one practice, i.e. voting, deliberating, directly participating within the larger democratic system. Now, democratic system approach looks at how well democracies make use of the different practices of recognizing, joining, resisting, deliberating, representing, and uh, voting and exiting to deliver on these three overarching functions or problems that I mentioned, empowered inclusion, collective will formation, and agenda setting, and collective decision making. Now, the problem of empowered inclusion is about the incorporation of individuals that are impacted or are potentially affected by a decision in ways that would allow them um, to demand and enforce their inclusions through votes, legal standing, representation, vetoes, organized opposition, and so on. Uh, the problem of collective will and agenda formation involves the conversion of individual preferences, values, interests, and preferences into shared agendas and collective wills through advocacy, bargaining, persuasion, argument, and negotiation. And finally, the problem of collective decision making addresses the collective ability of agents to establish enforceable decisions. So a system can be considered more or less democratic depending on how well it utilizes the political practices mentioned above to respond to the three problems of democracy. My aim in this paper is to examine and offer an assessment of the democratic system and each of these different practices based on their ability to address these three problems using an intersectional lens. In doing so, I'm juxtaposing two systemic approaches, democratic systems and intersectionality, in order to demonstrate the limits and opportunities of democratic politics 
through the multi multiplicity of interactions and structures that condition these practices. And in doing so, I'm, I'm emphasizing two important and interrelated claims. First, the strengths and weaknesses of each of these practices in their ability to address the problems of empowered inclusion, collective will and agenda formation, and collective decision-making are determined by how intersecting systems of oppression and privilege create opportunities or hindrances for individuals and groups to make use of these practices within the larger democratic system. Second, the fact that we see differences in who can participate, whose voice is heard, who in policy processes benefit and how, and who has freedom of choice prompts us to expand the boundaries of the democratic system to include the potential repercussions of intersectional oppression that extend beyond particular practices, processes, or places. In other words, intersecting systems of oppression underlie the whole democratic system and not only affect different practices, but also the problems or functions of democratic systems. So what is intersectionality? I feel like I have to start with this, even though I believe most, everyone, almost everyone knows what I'm going to be talking about. So intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1980s to describe the experiences of Black women. But it's a concept that with a history that goes way back to people like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell. And it's also a concept that has been substantively described and utilized, even if not called that, by both indigenous and post-colonial feminists. Intersectionality holds that intersecting systems of oppression, such as heteropatriarchy, neocolonialism, capitalism, racism, and imperialism, constitute forms of oppression that characterize global geopolitics and influence all aspects of social life. As a systemic theory, intersectionality primarily concerns the way that things work rather than who people are. Intersectional perspectives on power, in particular, focus on demonstrating and challenging the ways in which systems of oppression operate together and reinforce one another, giving rise to distinctive challenges for those who are intersectionally oppressed and experience the effects of multiple systems of oppression concurrently. This experience is not merely additive. For instance, Black women simultaneously and differently experience sexism compared to white women and racism compared to Black men. An intersectional examination of democratic systems seeks to unpack the ways intersecting systems of power and privilege permeate political institutions, as well as different forms of political engagement, and in doing so result in social inequalities that limit the ability of subordinated groups to exercise power within and across multiple domains of power. In other words, using an intersectional lens allows us to acknowledge that democratic systems, broadly understood, are both aspirational and a set of constraints. Recognizing the systems of oppression that shape the political interactions as constitutive of democratic systems exposes this tension and uncovers gaps and possibilities in the organization of collective agency. My ultimate goal is to give a sense of how intersectional oppression can and does impact the ability of these practices to contribute to the functions of the democratic system. These practices, if you recall, are not democratic in and of themselves. What makes them, you know, recognizing, deliberating, voting, more or less democratic is how well they are used by agents in democratic systems in ways that addresses the problems of empowered inclusion, collective will and agenda formation and collective decision-making. My task in what remains of my time is to use an intersectional lens and examine the capacity of these political practices to really deliver on and address the problems of democracy. Now, I won't be able to address all of them, but I'm hoping to give you some examples. I'm going to start with recognition 
as a democratic, as a, as a political practice, because as Mark Warren explains, recognition is a founding moment of democracy through which peoples come into existence. When we recognize one another, we establish mutual connections to shared circumstance, affected interest, uh, common concern, common injuries, or common aspirations. Since this recognition is about mutual connections, it's not a one-off act. Recognition and indeed the creation of peoples can happen continuously in democracies when individuals and groups recognize a common aspiration or injury or shared interests. In fact, peoples are often changeable depending on the particular affected interest in question. But recognition as the most basic fact of inclusion Mark Warren warns us, is also rather weak as a practice in responding to the problems of democracy. It's not enough for empowered inclusion, nor can it contribute to collective will formation or decision making. And scholars have already paid attention to the fact that power permeates the act of recognition. For example, Frantz Fanon, Charles Taylor, Axel Honneth, Glenn Coltart have all talked about this. Powerful groups may choose not to recognize subordinated groups or to misrecognize them. And the act of recognition itself as something that is conferred or conceded to subordinate groups from the powerful groups can also reproduce and reinforce the same power relationships that have made some powerful and some subordinated. Looking at intersecting systems of oppression allows us to see how recognition may be denied within seemingly subordinated groups themselves. Take, for instance, the infamous Saw Ridge legal battle in Canada. When the government of Canada finally struck down the most patriarchal aspects and parts of the Indian Act, which deprived Indigenous women who married white men of their band membership and status, the Saw Ridge Band in Alberta refused to recognize Indigenous women who had been cast out of the community as a result of this prior policy as members of the community. What ensued was a long drawn battle launched by the unrecognized indigenous women using the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as a way to regain their membership and force the band to recognize them as members. Now, whether or not we choose to side with the indigenous women in this, in this case on the grounds of gender discrimination or side with the Sawridge band on the grounds of their rights to self-determination and drawing of their own membership boundaries, one thing is clear intersecting structures of settler colonialism, patriarchy imposed on and perhaps adopted by indigenous communities by the Canadian government through the Indian Act has, has had clear implications for the possibility of community-based recognition. Why does this matter for democratic systems if recognition as a practice is rather weak in fulfilling or addressing the functions of democratic systems anyways? Well, recognition matters as, as it is the acknowledgement of mutual connections based on common interests. It is the first step that oftentimes allows for other political actions to take place. It enables other political practices like joining or resisting or representing. These effects might be unintentional and yet result from the ways in which intersecting systems of oppression are compromising the democratic practice of recognition in this case. Take, for instance, the example of domestic violence laws and abuse shelters that Crenshaw herself uses in her text. Through policies that required explicit waivers of hardship to prevent deportation if you brought a case of domestic abuse to the courts, or failing to have bilingual staff in the shelters, institutions and processes that were designed to serve abused women centered around the experiences of abused white women and fail to recognize women of color and migrant women as victims of domestic abuse. What this, these examples show is that intersecting systems of domination can complicate, if not challenge completely, the practice of recognition for many intersectionally oppressed groups. And this can serve uh, not only to exclude and thwart the possibility of empowered inclusion down the line, but as the Sarage example and the abuse shelters examples show us, also collective decision-making. So I wanna now move on from recognition and try and uh, shove in another example if I can. And I'm gonna focus on, uh, on deliberation as a practice um, that could potentially respond to the problems of empowered inclusion, collective will formation and collective decision-making as one of the practices that we use. <clears throat> 
Now, deliberation as a practice uh, encompasses things like debate and discussion, but also inevitably negotiation and bargaining. But they're all aimed at generating influence through the offering and receiving of compelling reasons about matters of common concern. Deliberation as a practice, we are told, has limitations. First, and endogenous to the practice itself, deliberation is weak when it comes to responding to the problems of empowered inclusion or collective decision making. As Mark Warren argues, deliberation is not in itself a mode of empowerment, nor is it a mechanism for distributing empowerments according to entitlements for inclusion. And it is oriented towards collective agenda and will formation as its key strength is communication. And therefore it's unable on its own to secure binding decisions that are needed for collective decision making. Second, the second weakness, and exogenous to the practice, although perhaps endogenous to our power-laden world, deliberation can be weakened in its ability to respond to the problems of collective agenda and will formation because of internal exclusions following from different styles of communication and status effects of sex, race, culture, and ethnicity. This basically means that often women, people of color, or even people with less language fluency have either chosen to exclude themselves or have been seen as by others as having less to contribute to the collective agenda and will. Take, for example, gender bias affecting the practice of deliberation as an example. Iris Mary Young highlighted the power permeating the different communicative styles of men and women within deliberation and how these styles tend to favor men. As she noted, women engage in dialogue in tentative, exploratory, and conciliatory ways, which is different from men who are more assertive and confrontational. This, she argued, made men appear more persuasive and silenced or devalued some people and groups. Now, this is absolutely the case, but intersecting systems of domination create distinctive experiences of deliberation as a practice of democracy for some group. So let's take a look at that example of gender bias and deliberation again. So as I said, Iris Maringon is correct that gender differences in styles of communication can make men come across as more assertive and therefore particularly privilege them in the process of collective agenda and will formation. However, when we consider the impact of the intersecting systems of patriarchy and racism together, we witness a different form of bias. In the case of black women, Assertive communicative styles within deliberation are not seen as persuasive. Indeed, their confrontational style would be deemed as deviant, a threat to the status quo. Intersectional domination underpinning our democratic system meets such assertiveness, oftentimes with anger, ridicule, or admonition. But an intersectional lens can highlight more obstacles for political practice of deliberation. Intersecting systems of oppression can create new exclusions that can undermine the practice of deliberation. Some of these exclusions are strategic, while others are as a, re are as a result of non-strategic or sometimes institutional discursive omission. For instance, consider the example of the politicization of domestic abuse in the United States. In deliberations preceding the passage of the Violence Against Women's Act, one set of experiences were strategically omitted, those of Black women and women of color generally. Their experiences were erased out of the process of collective will formation and agenda setting through the strategic silences of feminist and anti-racist groups. Why was this the case? Well, feminists were driven by their desire to counter the discourse of domestic violence as a minority problem and wish to demonstrate the omnipresence of domestic violence by focusing solely on white women. Anti-racists, meanwhile, were driven by their fear that acknowledging that, the, like the, that domestic violence takes pla place in Black communities or minority communities would perpetuate stereotypes of Black men and minority men as violent. There's the result of this of the intersecting, if, huh, intersecting systems of patriarchy with racism meant that Black women, whose voices should have been included in the discussion and represented by feminists due to their identity as women and or anti-racists due, due, due to their status as Black, were silenced. But such omission or silencing does not need to be strategic. 
For example, take the efforts made by the Dutch government to foster debate around sexual orientation in the Netherlands, which inadvertently and institutionally silenced queer Muslims. The Dutch homo emancipation policy, as they called it, I'm not calling it, they called it that, focused on encouraging and supporting individual emancipation through individuals coming out and speaking out about their own homosexuality. By limiting the frame of deliberation and debate around the topic of homo emancipation, by focusing slowly on individual emancipation through coming out, the experiences of queer Muslims who have a different relationship to their sexual identity and religion were erased. Now, using Hans's work, words, coming out in this case reinforced a form of identity formation that allowed one to take part in the discussion. If you didn't fit the form, erasure may follow. In this case, the intersecting systems of religious bias, heteronormativity, and even Eurocentrism work to force queer Muslims to choose between their culture and kinship loyalty on the one hand, or the Dutch culture where taking on a gay identity and openness is seen as the freedom ideal on the other. An intersectional lens shows us how intersecting systems of domination can operate to rob individuals and groups from the hermeneutical resources needed to give their voice, uh, give voice to their experiences, preferences, and interests within democratic systems. Since deliberation as a practice is all about individuals and groups revealing their preferences and pooling information together in order to arrive at a collective agenda, through deliberation, negotiation, bargaining, such a hermeneutical lacuna can undermine the process in significant ways. It can also have significant impacts on democratic for other democratic functions or problems as well. When intersecting systems of oppression create both strategic and non-strategic forms of discursive erasure, the possibility of representing those discurses in order to create binding collective decisions is also limited. In such instances, deliberation within enclaves that are sensitive and responsive to intersecting systems of oppression can be particularly important. In the absence of a collective standpoint resulting from intersecting systems of domination, deliberation within groups can contribute not only to collective will and agenda formation, but also, unlike what Mark Warren tells us, empowered inclusion. Take what Patricia Hill Collins says about the direct connection that exists between deliberation, agenda setting, and empowerment of Black women. According to Hill Collins, discussion between Black women allows them to forge individual, often unarticulated, yet potentially powerful expressions of everyday consciousness into an articulated, self-defined collective standpoint. A standpoint or self-definition, which is described by Patricia Hill Collins as not only empowering, but the key to Black women's survival. The simple act of deliberation could allow intersectionally oppressed groups to fill the collective hermeneutical lacuna through, um, and through that construct a collective, collective selfhood on their own terms. Okay, so that's enough with examples. I wanna kind of tell you what I've been trying to do and bring it uh, to an end, hopefully. Intersecting systems of oppression as I have tried to show, underline every single practice and every single problem that democratic systems have to respond to. They create new weaknesses and strengths associated with the practices of democracy in their ability to respond to the problems of empowered inclusion, collective agenda and will formation and collective decision-making. Not everyone in a democratic system benefits from engaging in these political practices in the same way. Intersectional oppression, as I've tried to show, can challenge the functions of democracy in particular ways. Let's take empowered inclusion. Democracies, again, to remind us, must provide their citizens with entitlements and powers through which they can, as it were, demand and enforce their inclusions through votes, legal standing, representations, vetoes, organized oppositions, and so on. But what if the intersecting systems of oppression turn these entitlements and powers into disempowerments. And here, I want to return to how I started my talk. I write this paper in a settler colonial context where inclusion, where, whether it is simply formal or empowered, is fraught with coinciding disempowerments. 
what the case of Sawridge shows us is the insufficiency of empowered inclusion as a normative democratic function or problem when intersecting systems of oppression such as settler colonialism, patriarchy, and white supremacy creates zero-sum conditions for indigenous peoples. Either use your entitlements afforded to you by the government in the form of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms to demand your inclusion not only in Canada, but your indigenous community at the cost of further imposing settler colonial rule on indigenous communities, or accept those entitlements and powers as woefully inadequate under, set, under conditions of structural domination, where inclusion itself can simply be entrenching settler colonialism. Thank you.